My name is Janelle Weekly, and I am the manager of the Arizona State Museum's Photographic Collections, and I'm your host tonight. I want to welcome you to this program, coming to you from the Arizona State Museum on the campus of the University of Arizona. Both are situated on land that has always been home to Indigenous peoples, and today the greater Tucson area is home to the Oadam people and Pascuayaki. Stephen Trimble is passionate about the places and people of the West. Through his numerous books of photography and writings, he shares his love. His many life experiences shaped his understanding that landscapes have content, and his photographs illustrate his keen awareness of light, shape, and color. Stephen's ability to observe and listen helps him collaborate with the people he photographs to create stunning images. Over the past 45 years, he has published 25 award-winning books. He is the recipient of many awards, including Sierra Club's Ansel Adams Award for Photography and Conservation, the National Cowboy Museum's Western Heritage Wrangler Award, and Doctor of Humane Letters from Colorado College. And more recently, he spent a year as a Wallace Stegner Centennial Fellow at the University of Utah's Tanner Humanities Center. In 2022, the Arizona State Museum became the home of Stephen's extensive collection of more than 18,000 photographs of native people of the Southwest. These photographs are from his book projects, The People, Indians of the American Southwest, Our Voices, Our Land, the Village of Blue Stone, Navajo Pottery, Traditions and Innovations, and Talking with the Clay. Tonight, we are pleased to have Stephen share with you stories of his work on Talking with the Clay. Please welcome Stephen Trimble. Thank you so much, Janelle. And I am delighted to be here, delighted to see a lot of names I don't recognize, but a, a few folks from all the different corners of my life. So that is great. Uh, I just want to remember now to tell you that the pictures that I'll include when I get to the slides, and I still call them slides, are not just the uh, physical archive of all those slides and negatives that I gave to the museum last year, but include some of the digital pictures I've taken in, in more recent years that I'll also be giving to the museum. So there's, there's a bit of a mix in what you'll see. So let me begin by telling you a little of the journey that led to my photographs from Indian country. After a liberal arts college education at Colorado College, I worked as a seasonal national park ranger in the 1970s, serving my apprenticeship as a writer and photographer by publishing those small general interpretive booklets that you all buy when you visit national parks. These small books eventually got to be bigger books, books mostly focused at first on natural history, what lives where and why. When I felt the need for a broader science foundation for my writing, I came here to the University of Arizona for a master's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. After grad school, I worked for a time at the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff as director of their small press, and that job really cemented my professional commitment to books. I also became a lifelong member of the Southwestern writing and photography community, a connection I still treasure. In the early 1980s, I left the museum to freelance full time. I moved to Santa Fe, a place I loved, a place I'd always wanted to live. My house was just three miles from San Ildefonso Pueblo in the Pewaukee Valley, and I began to photograph plaza dances at my neighboring Pueblo villages even before I received a phone call from a friend who changed the direction of my career for the next decade. Robert Brunig had been curator of anthropology at the Museum of Northern Arizona when I worked there. And when he called me in 1984, he was curator at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, in charge of creating their new permanent exhibit, Native Peoples of the Southwest. The new wing would open with a slideshow about contemporary Native people to give museum visitors a sense of the vitality of these living cultures before they walked on into the display cases filled with remarkable objects made by these people and their ancestors. Bob gave me the job of interviewing and photographing in the field, bringing portraits and voices back to the project's team to construct this slideshow. I was sort of a shuttle diplomat, a messenger sent out into Indian country 
to gather stories and images for this specific celebratory purpose. And so I spent six months in 1984 driving my truck many thousands of miles back and forth across New Mexico and Arizona with my dog, Carlos, and my tape recorder and my cameras. What I brought back along with the landscape photography of Harvey Lloyd became the slideshow and later the book, Our Voices, Our Land. Those images form the core of the collection that I've donated to the museum. That fall of 1984, after the joyous opening of the Heard Museum exhibit and the end of my assignment, I was back home walking across the Santa Fe Plaza one day and went into a gallery to look at an intriguing Acoma Pueblo pot displayed in the window. I mentioned to the, the manager of the gallery that I was a writer and photographer, and she said, you know, we don't have a book that really captures the way that the Pueblo potters feel about their work. We, you ought to do one. We need that book. So during my time working in Our Voices, Our Land, I had been continuously moved by the eloquence and the generosity of Native people. I would loved doing those interviews and making those photographs. And I'd also loved Pueblo pottery since my family trips to New Mexico as a teenager. I knew a Pueblo pottery book would be gratifying to create. And so I went back on the road and began to seek out, interview, and photograph potters in villages from Taos to Hopi. The School of American Research in Santa Fe published Talking with the Clay in 1987, another book filled with stories, filled with the potter's spirit, photographs of their work and their countenances, and their narratives of learning to make pottery, dreaming their designs, pottery growing right out of their lives. Not long after that, a publisher asked me to take the same approach and extend it to all 50 Southwestern native nations and whole cultures. Full of naive enthusiasm, I said, yes. I signed a contract to deliver a 200 page manuscript in one year flat. The next week, I met the woman who was now my wife of 36 years. And during that year of the contract, I went through courtship and moving to Salt Lake City and marriage and buying a house and the birth of our first child. One year after signing the contract, I began to work on the book. Five years after signing the contract, I delivered a 600 page manuscript. The content demanded that depth, even though it's just an introduction. The scale of the project had outgrown the original publisher. And so I took the, took, took the book back to the School of American Research, who had published Talking with the Clay, and the school published The People in 1993. I wanted you to have this history because this is where these pictures come from. The People contains quotes from some 400 individuals. Early on in interviews, I shifted away from using a tape recorder, as I had taped all those interviews for Our Voices, Our Land. The transcriptions just overwhelmed me. So I would generally show up in a reservation community unannounced with just my pen and my notebook and begin knocking on doors. I searched out people I had been referred to by staff at museums across the Southwest or by other native people I'd spoken with. If I didn't have a contact to begin with, I would go into the little mini mart at the crossroads that leads into every small town in the West, native or non-native. And I would ask the woman behind the counter there, and it was virtually always a woman, who I should talk to. Sometimes I had to do a lot of knocking to find the person I was searching for, passed on from house to house. I was given directions like, drive down there and turn left where the windmill used to be. Sometimes when I did reach the right door, people would say, well, this sounds interesting, but today isn't such a good day. Why don't you come back another time? And they knew that that meant another trip, maybe months later, maybe an extra few hundred miles of driving. But if I did come back, they would remember me and with a wink and a small smile, they generally would relent. I had passed a test. They would invite me in and start telling me incredible stories. And after about a half hour sitting at their kitchen tables, watching me right away in my notebook, they would sit back and pause and say, now was it, what is it you're going to do with all this again? Not until we had talked for an hour or two would I ask if I could photograph them. It's a long journey from these stories shared over a cup of coffee to the published pages in my books, and now to the photographic collection that has found its permanent home here at the museum. In so many ways, these really aren't my photographs. As much as I love my home territory in the Southwest, this isn't my land. 
we live on indigenous ground. These photographs come to you through me from the people, from native folks generous enough to allow me to point my camera at them. I couldn't do this work today. Native people now speak for themselves. Native artists take their own photographs as they should, and I'm delighted by their work. I'm keenly aware that I happened to intersect Native America at the moment when I did. I was lucky. I was honored. I hope I have done right by all these people who shared their lives, their families, and their art with me all these years ago. I'm sure many of these folks don't remember my brief visits, interviews, portraits. Many other of these photographs were taken at public events, ceremonies, dances, powwows, parades, where I was just one more, one more white guy with a camera permit. When it came time to find a home for my archive, I wanted to keep these pictures in the Southwest, where Native people will have easy access to them, and where the children and grandchildren of the folks I photographed might discover these family portraits. I'm thrilled that these images, many of them now almost 40 years old, will be around long after I am gone, treated with such care by the museum. I absolutely trust the Arizona State Museum to watch over their use and publication, knowing they will depend on advice from Native advisors. And now to the pictures. So when Janelle and I and Darlene talked about what to call the show, we kind of did a riff on my pottery book, Talking with the Clay, and decided to call this Talking with the People, Talking with the Clay. Well, what am I going to do when I go out there to start taking pictures in Indian country? I'm going to tell stories. I think of myself as an editorial photographer. I'm not out there to make art. I'm, I'm really there to tell a story. And my first assignment is to capture images that tell the story of the relationship of these people in their land. That's especially easy in Navajo country, where you have these dramatic backgrounds like Shiprock, or uh, I'm gonna see if I need it, there we go. Shiprock or a Monument Valley and the bold architectural graphic of a Hogan. And so it's a great place for photographers. And then of course, I'm gonna take pictures of people and the way that they interact with that landscape and follow a woman out with her sheep in the morning. As a photographer, you're always trying to put yourself in the path of opportunity. And so I try to keep my eyes open and pay attention as I drive the next long journey to maybe an, uh, an appointment where I'm actually going to interview someone. And I might stumble upon, upon a graffiti on an old abandoned billboard in big mountain country where the Hopi and Navajo are, are still disputing that, that land. And I figured that Graffiti has a lot to say, a lot of story to tell. I even like those tumbleweeds at the bottom of the picture. Sometimes the story is, is just the pure joy of a young Navajo boy getting ready to dance at the Navajo Nation Fair. At Hopi, photo photograph photographs are a little bit more difficult. It's a more conservative place, and you generally need to be with a Hopi person to photograph. And here I am with Eugene Sikakwaptawa, down in the Eagle Clan cornfield below Old O'Reilly. And I've always loved this picture in the way that his red bandana mirrors the shapes of those corn stalks. Sometimes I can tell the story with just a graphic detail. A tight shot of Hopi corn tells us a lot about these best dry farmers in the world. And of course, one of my jobs is to make sure that you know these are contemporary people living in these amazing landscapes. And so when I happen upon a traveling carnival set up beneath Doya Yelani, the sacred mesa at Zuni. I'm pretty excited because I have the sacred mountain and the carnival lights. What could be better? Tradition, Juanita Ahil collecting saguaro fruit in the Sonoran Desert. And then up the road at Ak Chin, autumn people just hanging out their laundry in the desert, living in the desert, living in their home. And as a photographer, often I just get tremendously excited when I see wonderfully graphic images, uh, like these shadows of Apache mountain spirit dancers cast on the weathered turquoise plywood at the Navajo Nation Fair, a picture that we thought was graphically interesting enough to put on the second edition cover of The People. 
the details of art sometimes are all I need to tell that story. Uh, a, a single picture that kind of captures the way that people feel about what they make. An old beaded belt from Southern Utes, a San Juan Paiute basket, a Navajo rug. And then of course, the next step is to have the artist hold their work. This basket by El Nora Mapatas at the Wallapai Reservation. These pieces of art that Native people make tell the stories powerfully, like this corn maiden doll made by Stella Teller at Isla de Puebla. And then there's ceremony, of course. And ceremonies are fabulous to experience and fabulous to photograph when that is allowed. Christmas Eve at Taos Puebla is a classic combination of those traditional uh, dances and traditional attitudes mixed in with the missionary church and its crosses on top silhouetted against the sky. But again, got to pay attention as a photographer, right? Because off behind me is this uh, ristra of, of uh, New Mexico chili against the adobe towards sunset. Don't want to miss that. The Tewa Pueblos around Santa Fe are remarkably open and generous about photography. You know, buy a photo permit and, and I can take pictures of a deer dance at Oke Owinge, San Juan Pueblo. That young man is not really looking at me, he's looking behind me. And off behind me, there's a, a Pueblo man with a gun who's gonna fire around and every one of those dancers will scatter into the village and have to be ransomed by their family with a side of venison or something equally valuable. So this was taken just before that moment. And again, it, it seemed like a good choice for a cover. And that picture was on a cover of the first edition of The People. Sometime after that, I got an email from a young woman who said, that's my boyfriend on the cover. Can I have a print? And of course I said, yes. The, the Pueblo Plaza dances are glorious to photograph, of course. All that motion, all that color, all those costumes. And as I do that, I'm reminded that the Pueblo people make sure that we know that by being there, our presence amplifies the power of the dance. Those dances sending prayers for rain, for good harvest, the bigger the crowd, the more powerful the prayer. And even though I don't take video, even though these are still pictures, I look at them and I can, I can hear the sound of those bells and tortoise shell rattles ringing as the dancers wump their feet down into the plaza dirt. Another thing I like to do is set myself up at the side of a small ceremony, like this Pima dance group at Sakatan one day where I'll ask the MC to announce, hey, there's this photographer off in the corner and he'll take pictures of you and send you prints if you want. And so I had all the dancers parade past me, line them up against a, 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 an adobe wall or a stucco wall as background and had the chance to take pictures of these gorgeous young dancers. I did the same thing with a Head Start class at Laguna Pueblo, where the kids were practicing for their dancing. And again, with a group of Southern Ute teenagers who came up to Meeker, Colorado to revisit with their elders, the site of the so-called Meeker massacre. I really like to tell the stories of, of uh, reservation communities and native nations that are not so well known, like, a, like the Hickorya Apache in Northern New Mexico, who move, move out from their village, from their town, Dulce, in mass to Stone Lake and spend several days in teepees for the annual relay race between their two clans, the white and the red. Really quite moving to see them just glory in that tradition. At Wallapai at Peach Springs, I was invited back for the memorial powwow when the whole village spends a day mourning all of the people who have died in the previous year and then take the clothing that they wore during that morning, place it on the Ramada and burn it at dawn. Acoustic photography, what a strange term. I was sitting around the dinner table once with my family and we were talking about the way that I take pictures and we came up with this as, as a way to describe it. Uh, a long time ago, Harvey Lloyd, the 
other photographer who contributed to our Voices Our Land and, and produced the show, said to me, you could do two things as a photographer to put people at their ease. You could drape yourself in cameras and lens bags and photo vests and basically make yourself look completely foolish and people will dismiss you as non-threatening, harmless, and ignore you, and you can go about your business. The alternative is to pretend that you're Henri Cartier-Bresson, the famous French photographer who skulked around in the shadows and made himself invisible, wearing neutral clothing where no one would even notice him. I lean toward the latter, and that leads me toward acoustic photography. At those dances around Santa Fe at the Tewa Pueblos, there's this great chance in between the rounds of dances in the plaza when the kids go back behind the kiva and just hang out. And I would follow them and kind of squat down in a corner and just watch them run up and down the stairs and hang out with each other. One of those times when you make contact, eye contact, uh, it's great fun, but often they're just paying no attention at all to me. And one of those, one of those photographs from exactly that situation ended up on a cover of Our Voices, Our Land. There are adults back there too. This is a Kiva chief at San Defonso Pueblo. Another place where I love to take pictures when people aren't really paying much attention to me is the traditional clothing competition at Santa Fe Indian Market every year in August. All the amazing uh, costumes and traditional clothing that people are going to wear they they dress up in all these finery, all their finery, but they're just hanging out behind the stage, waiting for their turn to go out and be judged. And so I would go back behind the stage and take pictures of them when they were getting ready to go out and stand resplendent before the judges. And I was able to get much more casual and spontaneous photographs than I could if I took pictures when they were on the stage. Plus, they were always wearing a big number right on their chest in the main competition. And I, I really just reveled in this. And I would often tell the folks that I'd photographed what I was doing and, and get their address and, and send them a print. Parades are another great time to take pictures. Everyone loves a parade. Everyone loves to be in, including the Zuni Oya maidens who dance with those Oyas on their head in parades across the Southwest. Or Danny Solis, a young Otem boy who I photographed at the Casa Grande Otem Tash, Otem Tash. Uh, years ago, I heard through the, through the grapevine that he was aware of the publication of this picture in several places, and he really got a kick out of it. Keep looking for those graphic details, a handprint on the side of a horse in the parade, the back of a Pima dancer. And then after the parade, the, there will be uh, some small demonstrations of traditional culture maybe the Apache Mountain Spirit dancers, the Gan dancers, and here Narciso Bule preparing his son Angelo to dance as a Yaki deer dancer. Rodeos, great place to photograph. I have all the motion and excitement of the bull riders and the calf ropers and the bull riders, plus the kids with their 4-H animals. I often would be asked to take portraits of kids after I'd interviewed and photographed their parents and grandparents. And so I would set up kind of a more formal portrait like this one, but I was always looking off to the side whenever I was photographing people because the kids were watching me with great intent. And when I point my camera toward them, sometimes they'd run away, sometimes they'd hide, sometimes they'd look at me from inside the house but it was another chance to take pictures that were just a little bit more spontaneous. The biggest honor, of course, was having the chance to speak with and photograph elders. This is Hostin Mud Kid, a Navajo man who had voted in the 1992 election at El Jado Trading Post and needed a ride home. So I volunteered. He spoke only Navajo, but I had kind of a nonverbal permission from him to take his portrait. Jose Lorenzo Pino, a war captain standing in the plaza, Tusuki Pueblo Fiste. Elnora Mapatis, the only elder at the time who could tell the Wallapai exactly how to proceed as they went through the day of their memorial powwow. 
and Bertha Russell, also Wallapai at Peach Springs. Perhaps the most personality of all of those elders that I photographed. It's a risk as a photographer to go this tight, but I really felt that Bertha's power deserved that and that this is the way to, to kind of communicate everything that she told me. In, in the last year of her life, she was dying of kidney disease when I interviewed her in 1984. And Bertha was telling me stories told by her grandmother when she was a little girl. Well, that takes me back to the beginning of the 20th century. And her grandmother's stories were about her grandparents, which took us back to the middle of the 1800s. We're still so close to that past. And Bertha's grandmother's story about her grandfather was gut-wrenching. She talked about watching him be uh, whipped to death by the U.S. cavalry as the Wallapai were forced to march down into the desert to La Paz. Lee Marshall at Supai went back to Washington, D.C. to testify when his people, the Havasupai, were asking for 185,000 acres of tribal land to be restored. And Lee sat down in front of all those old white men in suits in Congress and said, I, I hear you talking about the Grand Canyon. Well, I am the Grand Canyon. You're looking at it. This is McKay Pickivit at Kanash, Utah, who had spent many years of his youth fighting for the restoration of land, any land, for the Paiute tribe of Utah after their termination in the 1950s. Jose Huichapa in front of a mural in Guadalupe, the little Yaqui village on the edge of Phoenix. I do have to admit that while I took this picture, there were some young, younger Yaquis who were uh, <laughs> rooting through the trunk of my car and uh, finding some really good camera equipment that they decided that was theirs and not mine. This is Bert Cooley at um, the Gila River Reservation, whose, whose life really mirrored the pattern of many Native people. He grew up here, then went off and was a professional painter in Phoenix for years and years and years, and then came back to live where he really felt at home and really reveled in uh, his garden, where he couldn't get young people to help him, but still planted the old, the old uh, plants, the old species. And this, this ironic picture is Elvis Huger, the curator of the Mescalero Apache Museum in Southern New Mexico, who told me that she had tapes of Geronimo's medicine song sung by her father that she would listen to when she felt down. Direct descendant of the Apache chiefs Naiche and Cochise, and here standing in front of these silly men wearing traditional Mescalero clothing. Sometimes to communicate the feel of a of an elder, it's simply to take pictures of their hands or their hair. The matriarchs of Pueblo Pottery were still alive, 20th century Pueblo Pottery, when I was photographing in the 1980s. Lucy Lewis at Acoma, Virginia Duran at Picarese, and Kate Davis at Navajo Potter, a picture from the project that Janelle mentioned, my little book about Navajo pottery that I took pictures for, but did not write. So every once in a while, rather than moving quickly and making contact with a few people and doing some interviews and taking some pictures and going back down the road, I had the chance to spend a chunk of time somewhere and have a remarkable experience. Whenever I was in Indian country, I was watching bulletin boards posted at tribal headquarters or at mini marts announcing ceremonies or rodeos. And uh, when I was passing through White River several weeks before this picture, I noticed that there would be an Apache coming of age ceremony to which everyone was invited. And so I came back for Jeanette Larzelier's coming of age ceremony, puberty ceremony, which was gonna be four days of the whole village coming out to dance her into womanhood with the Apache medicine man singing the Apache creation story behind her. You know, she begins the dance with a young friend. She uses a cane throughout the, the four days of ceremony and that absorbs all of that power. And she can take that cane out when she's an elder herself and the cane will have that power captured. She then dances with an older woman of impeccable character 
She kneels to represent changing woman who kneeled at the edge of a mesa and was impregnated by the sun. She wears an abalone shell on her forehead, just as changing woman, the first Apache, sealed herself in an abalone shell to survive the flood that then yielded Apache people on the surface of the earth. I kept taking these pictures right in the thick of things and was there on the third day when the entire village filed by Jeanette and her sponsor and blessed them with sacred cattail and corn pollen. And uh, along about this day, I, I turned to Philip Casador, who was an Apache medicine man that I had met through the Herd Museum project. And I asked him if it was really okay for me to be right in the middle of everything and taking all these pictures. And Philip said, it's okay. No one in this village told you to quit. You have the nonverbal release, the nonverbal permission from the entire village. And then he kind of smiled. But I think it made a, a big difference because I, it was clear that I was there in association with Philip, watching as Jeanette just acquired more and more power and the ability to, in turn, take that power, the power of changing woman, and bless the other folks in the village. She ran to the four directions. The village followed her. And on the final day, a young man took this eagle feather and sprig of sage and dipped it in that basket of clay and painted Jeanette until she was pretty much covered with the power of the earth, with all of that clay. She danced through the teepee made from branches from the four kinds of trees that lightning cannot strike. And I saw her a few, year, a few weeks after that at the Apache Tribal Fair wearing just jeans and t-shirt. And I think she still looked as transfigured as she does in this picture, which I kind of think might be the best photograph I've ever taken. Well, I want to finish with pictures of the potters. Talking with the Clay just might be my favorite book. And again, this will be a mix of older pictures that the museum already has and more recent digital photographs that they will have. Pueblo people have an intimate relationship with clay. They mix the clay into the adobe that they put on the walls of their homes. They mix clay to make pottery that it does everything from gives them something to make a good pot of beans in to allow them to put a kachina on a pot. A kachina that they would not represent in any other way. You would never photograph kachinas at Hopi, but it's okay to, uh, to decorate pots with kachinas. I had the opportunity to, to meet and interview and photograph some of these amazing women that kept pottery alive in their pueblos through the 20th century. This is Eudora Montoya at Santa Ana Pueblo and Josephine Nahohai at Zuni Pueblo and her family. These women who were absolutely insistent that other people in their communities keep pottery going. The Martinez family, ob obviously going back to the great Julian and Maria Martinez at San Alfonso, bringing prehistoric designs back to life in the black pottery. At Acoma, potters like uh, uh, Rebecca Lucario making a, a parrot, a parrot chair, gorgeous one. Helen Schupla making melon bowls at, um, at Santa Clara, another super graphic picture that we used a, a variation of on the original cover of take, Talking to Clay. And then in contemporary pottery world, the potters are innovative and they'll take a, an old design like those melon bowls and swirl it as Hubert Candelario did here at uh, San Felipe, or take designs that you can't even imagine that look like abstract expression to start, like Les, Les Naminga. Uh, Hopi Potter has done on the side of this bowl. There's always this back and forth between tradition and real life and ceremony and the designs that the potters create for their pots. As Wilfred Garcia has done, taking the kiva lighter that he knows so well and having it emerge right out of his piece of pottery. Storytellers, figurative pottery, were pretty much invented by Helen Cordero back in the 1960s. And now there's generation after generation making storytellers of all kinds. 
including dinosaur storytellers and turtle storytellers and bear storytellers. And every one of those potters has, has the time to work on them and listen to them and talks about them being almost alive. They're singing. Can't you hear them? Roxanne Swenzel is another one of those figurative potters whose work I love and who has always has eloquent things to say about transmitting tradition, transmitting stories. You know, she works in clay and, and often the clay is then turned into bronze. Sometimes it's just the sheer incredible technique that blows me away. These little seed jars by Rebecca Locario at Acoma, who does these classic fine line pieces of pottery done by hand with a yucca brush. Sometimes those, those pots at Acoma turn into something approaching op art as this pot does, made by Dorothy Terivio. I had the, the wonderful chance to photograph potters in the 1980s and then come back for the 20th anniversary of Talking with the Clay and photograph whole new generations. Here's Stella Teller at Isleta in the 80s, and here's our daughter, Robin Teller, a generation later, pretty much becoming her mother and living just a few doors down from her mother. Stella Shativa on the right, at Acoma brought back corrugated pottery. And now her daughter, Jackie, is making corrugated pottery still. Mary Kane, one of the, the grand dames of Santa Clara pottery in the 1980s. And then two generations later, her granddaughter, uh, Tammy Garcia, has incredibly eloquent things to say about the adaptability and change that has to come to tradition as we move into the future. And she applies all of those thoughts to making what may be the most highly refined, most remarkable and precise Pueblo pottery that we see today. And this is one of her pieces from Santa Clara, you know, selling for tens of thousands of dollars. So back to Taos, you know, the iconic image of a Pueblo made out of adobe, made out of mud, made out of clay. When I interviewed the matriarch of Taos Pueblo pottery in the 80s, it was Virginia Romero, who had been making pottery since the, since the teens, and told me that she had never lost a pot in the fire. A generation later, Angie Yazi is taking that micaceous clay and making these huge, thin-walled, light pieces. Diego Romero might be one of the most innovative contemporary potters. Not only does he have an incredible sense of humor, uh, he's from Cochiti. He's got these membrace figures playing golf. And again, always eloquent things to say. You know, he's taking narratives and putting them on the sides of his pots, narratives of his people and his life and the greater society. And here he's taken us right back to the Pueblo Rebellion and Pope, the leader of that rebellion. Really, really interesting person. Kathleen Wall at Hamas was delighted when she saw this picture because that little jar behind her with the pink label, which I hadn't even noticed, happens to be a jar of something called Duncan Underglaze, which is something that uh, ceramicists would use, something that she learned about when she went to the Institute of American Indian Arts. And as she says, why not use it? I've been to art school. I am the person who made this. I'm not just an... Uh, Hamas Pueblo woman, I'm also someone who is uh, living in the 20th century. But they all start with dirt. They basically go out into the canyons and mesas and bring back clay and all these colors and spend enormous amounts of time cleaning and soaking and draining and shaping and finally getting to where they can, they can begin to work with the clay. Without the clay, you can't have the pot, but without the human, you can't have the pot either. It's a relationship. And remember that the thing that defines Pueblo pottery is that none of these folks are using a wheel. They work with coils of clay that they have cleaned. It's already a material that they have invested a lot of time in. And coil by coil, or with a figurative pot, just with a big chunk of clay that they can work with remarkably quickly into making a, a figure, they move forward step by step. When you visit a potter, there is clay and pottery all over their house. 
pots drying in the living room, pots ready to be sanded on the kitchen counter, bean pots lined up on the mantle ready for the next feast day. It's really, it's really just a thrill to be in those spaces with them. I keep going back to Roxanne Swensel, who, whose work I think tells stories better than any other potter. This piece is called Making Myself. It's a sculpture of a Tewa Puebla woman coiling her own leg out of clay. Roxanne is part of the Naranjo family from Santa Clara. This is Rose Naranjo, the, uh, the grandmother, the matriarch in the early days of my work. And every one of her kids is just a remarkable, accomplished person. This is Rena Swensel, who is Roxanne Swensel's mother, who has a PhD in American studies and was one of the most eloquent people I ever spoke to about the spirituality of Pueblo architecture. Here's Jody Falwell, one of the real innovators in pottery. And Nora Naranjo Morris, all children of Rose Naranjo. Uh, Nora made figurative pottery, delightful figurative pottery for a long, long time, and then moved on to more abstract work, including an installation in front of the National Museum of the American Indian on the mall in Washington, DC. We haven't gotten to firing, we're headed there. Here's Max Early at Laguna uh, on a hot day with a fire in front of him, sweat trickling down his face in the reflection of the fire in his sunglasses. Firing really is judgment day. And here's Garrett Maho at Hopi below First Mesa, building his fire for his Hopi pottery, resting the pots on broken pieces of pottery, pot shirts, protecting them from the fire with bigger pieces of broken pottery, and then building up the fire with manure and leaving it to itself for a couple of hours and coming back afterwards and finding a successful firing, just beautiful pots with the little burnished variability and color that you get in Hopi pottery. That's one way of firing. That's an oxidizing fire, plenty of oxygen in there. Uh, back over along the Rio Grande at Santa Clara and San, El San Ildefonso, they start with a similar firing. Here's Recita Naranjo's uh, sort of bucket of pottery that she's going to fire today, all covered with red slip. If, the, if she simply did the manure-fired oxidizing fire, that pottery would come out red. But then she's going to add a second step and smother the fire with finely ground horse manure and turn it into a reducing fire without oxygen that will turn the pottery black. And she and her family have to take the pottery out at exactly the right time very quickly so it doesn't reoxidize. My camera bag fell, uh, smelled, my camera bag smelled pretty smoky for a very long time. And one of the potters told me that uh, when she would come in from firing, her kids would say, Mama, you smell terrible. And she would say to them, that's the smell of money. Uh, let me finish with the journey of a single potter as he heads toward Indian Market. This is Jake Coopy on the uh, top of First Mesa, just a few steps away from where the Kachinas parade through the village, disappear into Kivas. And here he's working in his little cinder block studio. His paint rock on the desk there, some yucca stems you can see, as well as the case for his cell phone, where he may be getting calls from galleries in Scottsdale or Phoenix or Santa Fe or New York while he works. Like so many of the potters, he talks to the clay and the clay talks to him. That phrase talking with the clay came up over and over again as I interviewed potters and, and listened to them work, listened to them talk as they worked. Jake was just a master potter and just beautifully combined the, the designs of his family, the Nampeo family, going right back to Nampeo, who was bringing back prehistoric designs from Signatki with a really modern sensibility, design sensibility. So he's home, he finishes the firing, he uh, wraps up those pots and heads down the road heading for Santa Fe to get there in time for the Friday night competition to determine the award winners, and then to be on the plaza at dawn the next morning when he plunks his pot down on a table with a bunch of people in line to purchase it because that year, 
Jake Coopy won Best of Show with this remarkable piece of pie. And, and tragically, he only lived a few years after that. He died when he was about 40. So here's Roxanne Swinsel teaching us again with one of her pieces of, of uh, sculpture. Started with clay, now a bronze. A Tewa Puebla woman peering at that little tiny turquoise bead that I think holds everything. It holds tradition in any way that you choose to define it. It holds generations, millennia of native culture on this land from time immemorial. Another piece by Roxanne, a Tewa woman looking through a frame, kind of the way we tend to freeze native people in about 1880. That's what she's playing with here. All of these potters need to take a lot of time as they work. And as they do, they think, and they're happy to talk about what they're thinking about. And they think about big stuff. What is the pottery for? What is my life about? Is it really just about winning awards? Absolutely not. Max Early, again, who's also a poet, says, I'm a traditionalist living in a contemporary world and trying to figure out what that means. Well, what it means, I think, is right here in these words from Blue Corn. Not just the pottery making is a miracle, but the very fact that all of these native people across the Southwest are still here living in these fragments of their original homelands and sharing whatever they choose to share with us. And their survival is a miracle and their willingness to share themselves and their lives and their beliefs and their indigenous knowledge with the rest of us is a miracle too. So Stephen, thank you for sharing with us uh, your wonderful photography, your thoughts and your work and for enriching the Arizona State Museum's photographic collection with your very generous donation. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. And I feel like this is kind of one more step in sending my, my work, my pictures kind of on their journey. So <laughs> you were here. Thank you very much.